In this video, I'm going to tell you everything that I was wrong about for Soulforge Fusion. Board members, welcome back. The boardroom is once again open, and today I'm going back over Soulforge Fusion because the other day I unboxed my Kickstarter uh, set, and boy, was I really wrong about this game. Not in the way that you think. But unless you're thinking about the clickbait way, and then in that case, yes, that's exactly the way in which I was wrong. I was wrong in some of the ways that I explained some of the things that you do in the game. So I'm here for this video to kind of circle back on all that stuff. So let's take it from the top. What is Soul Forge Fusion? Soul Forge Fusion is a quasi-collectible card game in that each uh, booster kit you get, you get uh, four half decks, and those four half decks are make, made up of uh, four different factions. You have the Necrium, the uh, Tempest, the Utera, and um, I know there's another one that's escaping me right now. Oh, the, the Alloin, or Alloyan, uh, the, the metal uh, Allomancers. Those are the four different factions. Now, you take one of each of those half decks, and you put them together, and you make a complete deck. Those decks are comprised of ten cards each level 1, 2, and 3, so a total of 30 cards. So, for example, I have this uh, level 1 pack of Alloin. The name of the deck is called the Kludgy Able Patrols. There are 10 cards level 1, 10 cards level 2, and 10 cards level 3. So that's 30 cards. And then same thing with this uh, Tempest deck, 10 cards level 1, 2, and 3. Now, having said that, one of the other things that's unique about this game is that it's algorithmically printed so that sometimes you can get a, um, a, a Yeti in your deck but I have a Yeti in my deck that doesn't look anything like the Yeti in your deck. Uh, that's one of the things that I talked about. And the other things I talked about was not really knowing what the symbols meant. So I'm going to go back over all that stuff and kind of go over it in detail with you here. So starting with symbols, I've learned on the back of each of these cards. Now, I already knew that there was a list of cards that are in the deck. But I did have questions about some of the symbols. So I'm going to put that here and see if I can uh, maneuver it sans glare. Now... These are Kickstarter symbols, so they're green, which for my green screen is kind of giving it a fit of rage here. But uh, the green dot notes that it's a common card. The purple dot notes that it's a rare card. Then aside from the dots, some of them have rings around the dot. Now the rings are considered modifiers. So if you have a green ring, it's a common modifier. And if you have a purple ring, it's a rare modifier. So if you have a green dot with no ring, it's just a common card. If you have a purple dot with no ring, it's just a rare card. If you have a green dot with a green ring, it's a common card with a common modifier. If you have a green dot with a purple ring, it's a common card with a rare modifier. Now you could also have a purple dot with a purple ring, which would be a rare card with a rare modifier. Those are some of the, the most rare cards in the set. Uh, given that they're algorithmically printed, means that maybe your purple ring around your purple dotted card would be a different modifier then around my purple dotted card. So let's look at some of the cards and kind of better explain what I'm talking about. In this particular instance, um, let me just find a common, maybe, here we go. This is an Assailing Lasher. Now this Assailing Lasher has a, uh, let me get my pointer out again. It has a green dot with a purple ring around it. So this is a common card, so the Lasher is a common card, but the assailing part with the purple ring, that's the modifier. So the things that this card does as a Lasher does different things as other Lashers do. Uh, they have Camouflage with his Stealth. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Well, let me take a look, see if I can see some of the other ones right here. Uh, yeah, this Volcanic Invocist. It's Volcanic. So the Invocist itself is rare, purple dot. And volcanic is a purple ring around the purple dot. So let me show you that one up close, giving it some rare modifying effects. So that's what those symbols mean. There was one more symbol that was tripping me up, and it was, I don't know if it's going to be hard enough to see or not. And there it is, right there. This little, this little blue symbol next to a card. That's called the traitor symbol. I learned this from the Twitter crew at Soulforge Fusion, so shout out to their social media crew. I appreciate them answering that question. The traitor symbol, or betrayer symbol rather, means it's a card not normally found in that faction. So that particular card was the Forge Plate Yeti. So maybe the Yeti is uh, commonly found in, maybe it's in the um, Utera, which are kind of like the beasts, the, the, the strong animal clan deck. 
but this particular Yeti is found in this Tempest deck, which is more red, fiery, flamey, direct damage type of flavor deck. So that's those, um, those symbols there. What else did I get wrong? Oh, when I was talking about the actual Forgeborn, your hero, your avatar, your leader, however you want to call them, uh, I had mentioned that I, I got this Steel Rosetta deck and I would be the only person in the world with this Steel Rosetta deck. Well, kind of and kind of not. I would be the only person in the world with the Kludgy Able Patrols deck because this is algorithmically generated. So these particular cards in this particular format with these particular modifiers, yes, I am the only person with that deck. Uh, however, many decks have Steel Rosetta as their Forgeborn. What they might not have is Steel Rosetta's abilities in this particular configuration. Inspire at the hop, tinker in the middle, and repurpose at the bottom. Um, having played a little bit with Steel Rosetta, Inspire is super cool because as you build your deck, you need to take, like I said, two half decks, uh, merge them together to make one deck, but then you can only pick one of your two Forgeborn. Inspire, however, says... This has the level 2 ability of your unused for Forgeborn. So what I like to do when I use this particular person is I will stack my other Forgeborn that I'm not using with the ability showing. So Steel Rosetta gets Korok's first ability and then her second, or, or its first ability, but they're labeled 2, 3, and 4 because it's the number of cycles you go through your deck. Cycle 2 ability from Korok, and then her own Cycle 3 and Cycle 4 ability. So I think that's kind of a cool thing to do, to where you, you get to kind of use a little bit of that other Forgeborn's ability, and then the rest of your ability. Inspire, really cool idea. Kudos to you guys over at uh, Stoneblade for, for putting that in. I really dig that particular ability. Um, so, the other thing I've learned is in, the, in this particular set, now I haven't seen, I've seen a few, I have 24 half decks. And in the 24 half decks, I've only seen two Forgeborn for each faction. So I don't know if any more than that exist. Uh, I've seen Korak and, or Korok and Sunder. I've seen Steel Rosetta and Ironbeard. I've seen uh, Cersei and the Necromancer, was the Necro, Nyx, I think Nyx was the Necromancer. And then for the green, I've seen Nova, and i got to look this one up because I don't know this one off the top of my head. I've only used uh, Nova. I want to say Oros. Yes, O-R-O-S, so Nova and Oros. So those are the only Forgeborn as far as characters are concerned uh, that they're named. Um, oh, one other big thing I got wrong about this game. I was under the impression, and again, I had not done a whole lot of studying about this game because, look, it's a Kickstarter. And sometimes Kickstarters show up late, sometimes they show up later, and sometimes they don't show up at all. Not to say that Justin Gary hasn't delivered, because he has. I have every stinking expansion for uh, Ascension, and when I say stinking, I mean awesome, because they are. Except the pirates. Sorry, Justin. Wasn't my bag. That aside, um, you just never know when the Kickstarters are going to arrive. So I didn't want to put a lot of time into studying the game prior to it actually hitting. So when it hit, I was super stoked that it was here, and I dove right in. I thought to level up your characters that they were the ones that didn't get played and got discarded, then they would level up in some way, shape, or form. But what I've learned is the reverse is true. To level up your character, you play it. Let's get rid of these. Put this back where it belongs. You play it from your hand, then you retrieve the level two, in this case, the Bright Steel Colossus, or Blight, <laughs> Bright Steel Colossus. If you get that reference, you're awesome too. Uh, Take the Bright Steel Gargoyle level 2 from the pile here and you put it in your discard pile to be shuffled into your main deck later on in the turn when you cycle through your deck, which is every three turns. By the way, that's when your deck will recycle. You'll be left with five cards in your deck when you complete that cycle, if done properly. Um, I think that about covers it. When creatures die, they go to the banished pile. Um, I did get the Forge card part right. Uh, you start, one player starts with the forge card active and the other player does not control the forge and then it flips to its inactive side and the other player does control the forge. When you do control the forge, you play your cards here in the front to attack and when you don't uh, control the forge, you play your cards here in the back to defend. Uh, defenders always play back here no matter about your control of the forge. Uh, people with aggressive always play in the front no matter if you control the forge. Um, there's a whole slew of keywords. Uh, I can put the link to the glossary in the description below. It's very intuitive. I probably should have had that up when I opened the packs yesterday, but again, 
I was too excited. Uh, I have since built, I want to say, three or four different decks. My wife and I have played it. Uh, sad to say that she loves the uh, Necrium faction, so my guys don't last very long on the board uh, because she messes with them, plain and simple. I do have to figure that out. Oh, and she really likes dragons, so there's that too. Uh, so I'm, I'm fighting dragons and undead all the time around here. That's, that's our house, is undead and dragons. So if you lived here, uh, hopefully you would be into that because if you weren't, uh, you'd have a very, very rough time sleeping. With that said, I think that uh, wraps up this episode of uh, Boardroom Gamer. Um, I love the game. I can't wait to see what they do in stores. I'm really stoked about the organized play. I'm stoked about the online organized play using the, um, the website to scan your decks here and claim it. I think that's kind of cool. I did spend quite a bit of time claiming all 24 of those half decks yesterday. Um, and then there was one more thing that Justin Gary said in, his po in the podcast regarding this game and organized play. At some level, he talked about, and I don't remember what level, but at some level he talked about bigger championships where you would go on to play under the banner of your local game store. I thought that was really, really intriguing. Uh, don't know what that looks like, and maybe that was something that he was just hoping for. So, uh, Justin, if you ever see this video, maybe you can comment below and talk a little bit more about that. I'd really like to hear more about that particular aspect. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this, uh, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel for more of this crazy content. I talk about all kinds of things, board games, card games, you name it, solo games, and more. Um, and tell your friends about the channel as well. Thanks again for watching, and as always, we'll see you at the next boardroom meeting.